All right, we ready to get this thing going? Because we, we want to soak in a bit of Bible here, but then likewise really be able to take in the, this historical site. Pretty fabulous, amazing place. So much that goes on here. I mean, this is, this is the spot where, where Herod is trying to negotiate for the Sidonians and the uh, uh, residents of Tyre, and they're trying to kind of be a, a, a bit... Um, uh, deferential to him, and so they say, it's the voice of a god and, and not a man. And Herod's like, eh, you know, maybe on a good day. And the angel of the Lord is like, oh, no, you don't, and takes out Herod there and then, worms eat his body. Yeah. It's not the only time that, that angels visit upon this site, however. Now, some of the things that, that I think um, we came to Israel wanting to really be able to appreciate and experience was for sure, even as we were putting our hands down on the pavement in Sephora and out on the Sea of Galilee and throughout Capernaum, to be able to walk where Jesus walked. And that's really, really special. But there's something else that is really rather remarkable that we get to experience while we're here too. And that is to be in the very spot where there really was this outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And this completely new chapter in what God had in store for his people. And we find that happening right here in Caesarea in a way that changes everything for most of you that are sitting here. Acts chapter 10. Come on. Come on, Ed. Come on, Ed. Caesarea is the place where Origen, one of the brilliant yet universally misguided <laughs> fellows, I say that because he became a universalist at the end of his life, uh, uh, came to, to be able to settle and, and make his home base. It's also the spot where the great church historian Eusebius landed and, and took on the name Eusebius as he taught here. And it's interesting that as we read about a very important episode in the history of the church, an episode that is predicted and I'm referring to Acts chapter 10, but the episode that is predicted in Acts chapter 1, when God says in verse 8, this is Jesus speaking to, uh, to his disciples, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, just up the road, 50 miles, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And to the ends of the earth has a, a rather specific implication. And it's ta ethne, it's to the, not, not just to the ends of the earth, but it's, but it's to the nations, and more specifically, especially to this group of pious Jewish men, it's to those nasty, filthy, outsider Gentiles. Even they can somehow be cleansed of their repugnant, repulsive, anathema filth that they really are by the great work of the Holy Spirit. And here in Acts chapter 10, the fulfillment of that expansion of the covenant work of God here is, is given to us. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian, Italian Regiment. Italian Regiment is really like a cohort of say 600 to 800 soldiers. He was one of the, the centurions over those soldiers, over 100 of them. To be a centurion here in Caesarea, however, is no backwater duty station. This is a primo location. Now, as great as the centurion was who built the temple up in Capernaum, I don't think that centurion was fired up about having the duty station of Capernaum. That's not quite the cachet of being here in Caesarea. And he and all his family were devout and God-fearing. Both of those words are rather interesting, one for historical context, the other to give us a literary context. Devout is used here of, of Cornelius and his family, as well as some of the other soldiers. And the word for devout is Eusebius, or Eusebius. And I, I often thought, that Eusebius, when he relocated here to begin his work of ministry, took on the very descriptor of the man that made this such a famous place for a Christian to settle. 
And so a Eusebius uh, centurion uh, it was, was Cornelius, and thus Eusebius, the great church historian, take on that name. But that also says he's a God-fearer. A God-fearer is not just a, that's a description of, hey, he's, he's a good guy, kind of has a fear of God. It's a very technical term as one who was quite admir admiring of the, the Hebrew God of monotheism, of the morality, of the beauty of the law, but it was one who has not become fully a proselyte. In, in other words, he's, he's not yet been circumcised, but he's been one that has been studying and knows quite well, well-versed with the great law of the, of the Hebrew God. But to be a proselyte of this sort was sometimes to be called a proselyte at the gate. In other words, there was only so far that he could go in a synagogue and for sure any, any sort of a temple worship that was there. And so there he stood at the gate as others could progress even further towards intimacy with God. He had intimacy with God, but only up to a point. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day, about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. Now, three in the afternoon would have been one of the two times that a, uh, one who was pious would have been praying to God if he was acquainted with, with synagogue worship, 9 a.m., 3 p.m. And those that were like devout, devout, threw in one time in between at noon. But here he is at the 3 p.m. station of prayer. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius, now this is great, this is almost like Daniel's prayer. Daniel 9, just as he begins praying, and Gabriel comes zipping down to him and says, from the moment you began praying, we were kind of talking amongst ourselves in the heavens. And here I am now. And, and the same thing, Cornelius, just as he begins praying, whoops, whoa, here is an angel that now comes before him. Cornelius stared at him in fear. I bet. What is it, Lord, he asked. The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel spoke to him at gone, Cornelius called two of his servants, a Eusebius soldier, who was one of his attendants, and he told him everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. Joppa is also along the coast. Many of you were there just the other day. Head south, but it's no easy journey. It is a, a rather long journey that would require somewhat of an overnight march for this to be able to be worked out. For them to be able to arrive at the appointed time, they've got to get up and go and keep going and arrive probably just in time. So about noon the following day, it's incredible how God works all of this out, by the way, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up to the roof to pray. He apparently was so devout that he had not only 9 a.m., 3 p.m., but he was a noon guy too. But Peter is in a tanner's house. It's interesting that he's in a tanner's house because Peter, you're going to see, is very reluctant about all this kind of uncleanness that God is suggesting to him through the angel. And yet, here he is in a tanner's house, and it's just filled with uncleanness. And even all of the hides that would have been uh, you know, kind of tanning and drying along the shoreline there in, in Joppa uh, would have really, I think, caused Peter a, a lot of qualms. So apparently Peter is kind of taking one step at a time towards greater and greater uncleanness here and becoming a bit more acquainted or recalibrated to a, a certain uh, tolerance of uncleanness as he uh, is staying at the uh, Tanner's house. So he became hungry. So he went up to the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. While the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open and something like a large sheet being let down to the earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Rather remarkable event. Noon, there he is in some sort of a trance. The word is ecstasy. It's where we get this word of ecstasis. That he's in a... Oh, fair enough. Uh, my voice will carry. That, that, he's, that he's in some sort of a, a state of ecstatic trance, but yet even in the midst of this, it's interesting that some of the elements of what he was seeing around him seem to be incorporated by God into the vision that's given to him. 
all of the different animals that are on this sheet, both clean and unclean, some of the very animals that probably were all about him at that time as they were uh, hydra being tanned. But then the word for sheet is, is not a word that you would use for like, you know, your, your pillowcase. It's the word that you would use for a sail. And as he's on the roof on a shoreline home in Joppa, well, what would it be that he would see as he would peer out in some sort of a contemplative fashion over the Mediterranean Sea? He would see these billowing sails. And it's exactly a billowing sail, same word, that now comes lowering down from heaven before him. And on there, he sees some of the animals that he's really hungry to eat right now. And they would be the clean animals. And I don't know, maybe there's a cow on there and he's salivating at this point. But then he looks over and there's a pig, there's a lobster. Oh my goodness, they're chewing the cud in the wrong way. What's going on? And, and, and all of this is appearing before Peter to the point of real deep consternation that what, what is going on in front of me right now? And this is from the Lord. I, I, don't, I don't get this because he knows the implication. What, 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 he is, what he is saying through all of this is that God is no longer going to be making a special distinction of clean and unclean. It will become clear to him. Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, he replied. I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. We've been talking a lot about Peter's chutzpah throughout our time here. Here it is yet again. He's not afraid, even though it's the Lord from heaven giving him a direct charge, as intimate as Peter is with him, to be able to yet again, despite the exalted, glorified Jesus, to be able to say, all right, one more time, I'm going to disagree and argue with you in a very public way that will probably get recorded in this Bible thing that you're doing, but that's fine, go ahead, because I've never done anything unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. So you think maybe this time Peter's going to do better than the three times that it took at the end of John. And just maybe he's going to be able to get it. Not quite yet. This happened three times. And, that's, and immediately the sheet was then taken back or the sail really sailed on back up into heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, and just as he's wondering, what does this mean? Unclean men show up at his house. The men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was thinking about the vision, the spirit then said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. So get up and go downstairs. Don't hesitate to go with them, for I've sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for, why have you come? The men said, we're from Cornelius the Centurion. Peter would have discerned right away when he saw the men, these guys are not Jews. And here they are, and I have now, well, and it, it, this is the next step of incorporation on Peter's part. So now he has actually welcomed Gentiles himself. And, and now he, he says, I'm the one you're looking for, why have you come here? We've come from Cornelius the Centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man, respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter, big step, watch it, invited the men into the house to be his guests. Why? Because he already knew this is the meaning of the vision. I am no longer to discriminate based on clean and unclean. What God has called clean, let me not consider unclean. Took free, but he got it. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large... Oh, the next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. It's a long walk. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. Peter entered the house. Big deal for Peter now. Not only has he welcomed these three men into, into the house to be his guest, he has now done something that he's probably not done before. He has stepped over a Gentile threshold. As Peter entered the house, 
Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I am only a man myself. That would be a good lesson for others who take on the name of Peter to learn at this moment, but we'll leave it at that. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, you're well aware that it's against our law for a Jew to associate with or even visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius answered, three days ago, I'm in my house praying at this hour, three in the afternoon. A man in shining clothes, must have been rather remarkable, stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer, remembered your gifts to the poor. Send a job for Simon called Peter in a guest room of Simon the Tanner by the sea. So I sent immediately, good for you to come. Now we're all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Side point, you know what's interesting? Why didn't the angel just tell him the gospel? That's what we're for. Because if there was another plan, who do you think would have done it better? An angel of the Lord? Who would have been more remarkable to hear it from? An angel of the Lord? Or a Jew that already discriminates against you and you against him? And it is remarkable, though, this is the great responsibility that God has put upon us. And if we think there's going to be some other plan B, there's not. If we think there's going to be a cavalry riding over the hill to suddenly take up the banner and take on the charge, there's not. There's us, and we're enough. So I sent for you immediately. It was good for you to come. We're here, and tell us what God has commanded us. So Peter began to speak. I now realize it's true. God doesn't show favoritism. That word favoritism comes from two Greek words, prosopon and lambano. Prosopon is your face. Lambano is to grab. And the idea of favoritism would be for me to like grab Steve's face and to look at him and say, all right, you're in, based on how you look. And it's to discriminate based on outward appearance, appearances. And so even though Steve is a good looking guy, that's not getting him into the kingdom of God. Because God is not one that shows favoritism or considers the face, so to speak, here. But he accepts every nation, from every nation, the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the gospel, the good news of peace through Jesus, who is Lord of all. He knows because he would have heard from the other centurion that was at the cross of Christ. They all gathered back in Caesarea. That centurion was based in Caesarea. None of this happened in a corner. He would have been well aware of the story of Christ. You know what happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism of John preached? God anointed Jesus Nazareth with Holy Spirit and power. How he went around doing good, healing all under the power of the devil because God was with him. And we're witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people, to testify that he is the one God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him to everyone who believes and in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, and apparently Peter was speaking these words, but needed a little bit more convincing even as he spoke these words. It's almost as though he was just saying, hey, you already know. You already know. So really, how much more do you really need to hear from me? And in the midst of this kind of reluctant gospel sharing, look what happens. The Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Or as your footnote says, speaking in other languages. Then Peter said, surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They've received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few more days. And thus, through this miraculous, supernatural, transcendent work of God through ordinary people, even like Peter, he was able to expand the covenant 
beyond the confines of his own special possession, Israel. Even though Israel initially was chosen, not because they were more numerous, not because they were more righteous, just because God, in his sovereign election, looked upon them and chose them and loved them. And now here's an amazing mutual concession that's about to have to happen right now. The Jews are going to have to accept the dirty Gentiles into a covenant with them. And the Gentiles are going to have to admit that the Jewish Messiah was right all along. Those are big leaps on both parts here. But it's what God is requiring. And in order for him to be able to really seal the deal, he does send his promised Holy Spirit. And as Jesus says to his disciples gathered on that last night at that last supper, it's to your advantage that I die and go away. Because if I don't go, then what is about to happen won't happen. I'm going to send to you the advocate, the Holy Spirit. And when he comes, he's going to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Thus bringing about repentance, bringing people to faith, and allowing people to be able to have inclusion in the covenant with God. This covenant that God fears could only look on with huge admiration, a good bit of jealousy, and a sense of exclusivity that they could not be part of it. And there Cornelius, so longing to be not just at the gate, but be in the inner circle, suddenly doesn't have to go through all of Judaism in order to get to Jesus. Suddenly, Jesus is made available to him through direction and through the direct connection of the Holy Spirit of God. And a transcendent uh, covenant now that, that, that allows for the inclusion of all in this really terrific way. And, and, and this is our covenant. I mean, this happened here. This was the expansion of it all. We take it for granted. Like, well, of course we're Christians. Of course we're part of this. There's no, of course, a part of that. And God forbid we get entitled in any way. Like, of course this is ours. Oh, my goodness, for Cornelius, it would be more like, really? Do you, I mean, do you really think that I could maybe be part of this? Like, my family as well, this could be ours. And God is actually making that clear, not only through you coming here, entering my house, but the Holy Spirit now coming upon us. So that not only will the Holy Spirit come upon us to demonstrate something, but that we could be baptized and born again of the Holy Spirit, to have the Spirit flow within us like streams of living water, as Jesus preached at the great feast of tabernacles on the great day of the feast, that will flow from within us, something that even David could only hope to see as he said, please don't take your Holy Spirit away from me, because the Holy Spirit experienced up until this point was, was one, yes, where the Spirit would come upon you or fill you or control you, but never to really dwell within you. God in us. That's not just the promise. That's the reality. And not just in some vague way, but given to us as a seal and as a guarantee, Ephesians tells us in Ephesians 1, 1 Corinthians 2, that Ephesians 3, that this is a guarantee and a seal. You don't walk around wondering, maybe sort of, kind of. Nor does Cornelius. He was a demonstration of the opening by the Spirit coming upon him. But then Peter realized he can now experience the covenant in full. And so he was then baptized, born again of water and spirit, so that he could enter the kingdom of heaven, John 3, 5. He was baptized, reborn by the Holy Spirit, coming up, now filled with the Holy Spirit and filled with absolute certainty that he is included in what God's plans are. And so is every one of us. We have received that very Holy Spirit made accessible to Gentiles right here. That's our gift. We walk around and we've got what it takes. We're being sanctified by that very Holy Spirit. We are being prepared as, as we come to that place of ultimate sanctification to, to really be that very bride. Wow. This is our reality and not in some sort of vague way. It, it is your guarantee, it is your seal. It is not something that, that is, is so easily given and not something that's so easily kind of transient either. It is your state. God sees you as his child, regenerated by that very Holy Spirit of God. And 
And, and, and such with that, we need to walk around with that kind of certainty, that kind of clarity, that kind of confidence of what it is that God has given to us. And why has he given it to us? Well, because we got stuff to do. We got to honor him. We got to grow in our, in our walk with him. But also, don't wait for some angel to come to your rescue and be able to preach the gospel. God's already made it clear there's one way the gospel's going to spread, and it's going to be through all of us reborn of the Holy Spirit. And as the gospel was still, still quite concentrated at this point in time, it was in such a small period of time where it was a mere explosion that occurs. It was, it was Paul who was converted in just the, you know, the previous passage of our Bible, and you know, through that, so does the gospel make it to all the ends of the earth, just as the promise of Acts 1 is. First in Jerusalem, then in Judea, then into Samaria, then to the ends of the earth. Amen. As you stand here, be reminded, you too, you too are not just some transaction in the sight of God. You are reborn and given the gift, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God. You've got what it takes to be able to help all know what it is that we've got. Amen.